Many of my works are visual investigations, um, and I often do close readings, photographic close readings, where I study, for instance, plants, uh, animals, trash, or architectural components. And through these close readings, I'm studying the relationships between material life, political decisions, and changing urban landscapes. So the works exhibited are studies um, of um, the cityscape of Bucharest, um, which is a city undergoing dramatic um, changes due to the change of political regimes, but also due to a change from an industrial to a post-industrial environment. In the works, I'm studying stray dogs and building materials in order to look at how the urban space on a material level is impacted by the change from socialism to capitalism. But also I'm interested in how these plants or animals or materials um, in this context have a life of their own and an agency of their own. For the cyanotype series, building blocks. Uh, my assistant and I, we walk through um, different neighborhoods of Bucharest um, in order to collect building materials. And the cyanotypes depict both uh, building materials from new buildings, such as condos and shopping malls, buildings that are in a way significant um, to the current uh, urban situation, which um, to a high degree is marked by privatization. But also we collected materials from abandoned um, industrial buildings from the socialist era. And um, the cyanotypes were exposed to sunlight um, on the location of the materials themselves. Um, and I chose um, this format of the hanging textiles, um, um, which is a format with reference to, say, flags or aristocratic banners, um, symbols of power or symbolic meaning. The film The Dogs of Sector X is a study of the changing life conditions of stray dogs in Bucharest. And stray dogs started to appear in the 1960s, where the Ceausescu government erased a large village-like areas of the city and um, abandoned by their relocated owners, um, the dogs um, started to roam the streets and multiply over the next decades. In 2013, there was an estimate of 65,000 dogs in the city. And for this project, um, we followed uh, stray dogs through a residential neighborhood and um, engaged with people who take care of the dogs. And our movements were determined by the movements of the dogs we encountered. The work includes fragments uh, from interviews and they are available as a kind of a sound collage and also as a text. The sound is spoken in five different languages and the text is translated into English. I made the interviews uh, in the language that each person was using in their new country of residence. This uh, multilingualism demonstrates the fact that these Rwandans who uh, share the same mother tongue and share, share the same cultural background are now divided in different countries and have adapted in new living environments. And often it has been just a coincidence where they have ended up living after leaving Rwanda. On the other hand, uh, for the audience in the exhibition, the multilingualism uh, can demonstrate a situation which is very familiar to a migrant that uh, one might feel uh, excluded from the communication in a new and unfamiliar environment. I am exploring uh, the landscape as a component of national identity and how national identity is often depicted with landscape imagery and with certain ideas. But uh, more I would like to question the whole idea of national identity because, for example, if we juxtapose it with the idea of landscape, the landscape 
isn't something that can be confined uh, and moreover the landscape doesn't recognize the national borders. It was important to me to share the personal stories of these Rwandans I had met because it was, uh, it was kind of a mutual interest uh, not only to tell about their experiences as refugees but also about the reasons why they had to leave Rwanda. The project Berry Seasons is about the wild berry industry. It's a quite interesting industry for two reasons. One reason is that uh, no one owns the berries in the forest, but everyone can pick them. It's also an industry with a history of a lot of problems. There have been a lot of berry pickers that have been exploited. And most of the berry pickers today are seasonal workers from other countries. From a selfish point of view, I would say this project is all about me trying to understand the regional context from where I come from and where I live today. But it's also about uh, trying to connect this regional context to other regional contexts in the world. The process of this project um, started with a book project uh, with two cultural geographers, uh, Madeleine Eriksson and Aina Tollefsen. They had been researching the wild berry industry and we wanted to do, make a popular science book together with my photos and their text. But when I got the question to participate in this exhibition, I, I got a bit of a problem. Uh, when I was writing the text for the walls, the text ma mass kept growing and growing. Uh, eventually that became a book. Uh, that is now published and will be part of the exhibition eventually. The first photographs that I took uh, for this project uh, is from an old care facility in Brattby outside Umeå in Västerbotten. That facility was built in the 50s uh, and the last ones who lived there were Thai berry pickers. A lot of the work have been about trying to understand those photographs. When I've been working with other projects, it has been a bit different. I've often been a lot closer to the ones I've been photographing. And those projects have been more, probably been more about individual stories. And this project is more about a kind of structure. And my focus has been on traces uh, rather than faces. Maybe it's naive, but I've been thinking that somehow I want to make this project a bit less voyeuristic. I, for the longest time, wanted to make a piece that centered uh, women, uh, friendship among women. So women choosing to be there for one another and women basically just protecting one another and listening to each other. And in this case, building each other up and giving each other compliments. Uh, thinking of that, I also had to find ways or think around how I was protecting these women through my work. Uh, and one way was uh, also making octo suits, as I call them, uh, that are my wearable sculptures. Basically sculptures that also negotiate with the body in my performances. Um, so these octo suits are very impractical. They are like extensions of the body, but at the same time they protect one another through like the arms are them like having one arm over the shoulder and that is also creating like a shell for each other for them and then another way was like thinking through protection was um, a digital skin uh, or something an immaterial skin or which you can see in the video in the installation keeps coming up appearing and covering their face I also thought of another way to protect them was to also have a script around the compliments that they were giving each other because their friendship also exists outside the artwork. So some of the compliments were very real and other compliments were scripted, which is then based on different lists online of how to compliment a friend on WikiHow, which is also a strange thing to actually Google. but very real. I think sound is so powerful in a way that it can create this 
parallel spaces. So within visually, it's more consisting of loops, basically, while within sound, you can experience something linear or time, time is linear, or basically if you're looking for drama, that's where you can experience within the sound. Uh, so for instance, there are parts where you can hear my voice coming in uh, and giving instruction, but it's just like a tiny like couple of seconds. And then there's the other part where you hear the background noise. So it's, you can almost hear the traffic. Uh, and then w immediately when that comes in, it's almost like it jumps in the timeline or it creates like a whole new space that you see visually. This project uh, is, in my opinion, uh, completely about the human condition and about how we in life deal with certain events in our lives. What I realized right away when I came in there into that metal shop that I wanted to um, photograph in there because it was visually interesting. I also sensed uh, that it was, had come to an end, that everything was about to end. And uh, I kept on going and visiting them on, and photographing things around until they let me photograph them. And uh, during that time, I realized what I wanted to do. I wanted to make a book. Also, uh, during that time, uh, after having sat with them and drank a lot of coffee and listened to a lot of stories, I started to video them, or actually one of them, the owner, Elias, uh, without him knowing it. And that was uh, something that I did for a little while, and then he became aware, and he didn't protest. So I was able to uh, get him to tell me stories again with the camera on, after I realized that I wanted to make this byproduct that would be uh, the video of him telling some of these stories because he was a very well-read man and very intellectual. Uh, if you look at the still lives that I uh, incorporated into this project, a lot of, um, they are very important to me for the story because they are actually a portrait of the men as well, just another type of portrait, because they, they will tell you what kind of men they were, how they would uh, uh, treat their surroundings, their shop. I think this story is relative to almost everybody, because uh, uh, everybody can relate to this, because we all have uh, a certain amount of time. And this was the case with these team, two men. Their time had come to an end in that shop, and the shop had come to an end. And it took me a long time to do this. So time is also important in this. And it's important to take time and, or actually slow down, 